Lynch and me going when I heard it was going to go into the teens. Joining me now is Jeff Curry, Goldman Sachs, Global Head of Commodities Research. Uh, Goldman uh, sees record crude surplus and inventories building uh, by April. Also, Catherine Renivaria Bultic with us as well. Uh, hey, Jeff, do you think in the teens, could that really happen? Well, some crude somewhere in the world is likely to hit those numbers. I think that's critical to make the point that, you know, it, the market's going to be very, it's going to be indiscriminate who's going to get hit. And look, to understand whether this dynamic is likely to entail is, that, as you pointed out, we expect a crude build of 6 million barrels per day in April. We have never seen a build of this magnitude or this velocity. And as it hits the system, the question will be the logistics, ships, pipelines, storage facilities, and the key issue is if it hits a bottleneck somewhere along that way, where it hits the bottleneck is where you see the real downside risk. I like to point out in 2016, oil prices up in Minnesota actually went negative. Why? Because the producer had to pay somebody to get rid of it because you couldn't push another barrel in the system. So when, you know, Francisco makes that point about the prices dipping down in the teens, what he's indicating is that when the system blows out, you breach capacity to be able to deliver or to put into a pipeline or to put into a ship, the downside really begins to open up to the, you know, open up. But I want to emphasize, as soon as the system starts flowing again, the prices spike back up. And so the key point here is that volatility, mainly to the downside, is likely to be very high in coming months. So then to that point, it seems like what you're saying is the faster we fill up, the faster the pressure on prices, but then the faster we actually wind up picking back up and finding some stability. Right. In fact, what will happen is that you can think about this way. Once you have nowhere to put that barrel of crude and you have supply above demand, immediately supply has to be forced down in line with demand because there's no place to put it. And to get that immediate correction, you typically see prices collapse to the downside. But once supply and demand have been realigned, they typically pop right back up again. Historically, when you breach storage capacity or delivery capacity, you see record levels of volatility. I want to emphasize, though, Breaching storage capacity this time around is going to be difficult because we built so much of it in the last decade. Breaching logistics and delivery capacity is really where the issue is likely to be. Uh, Jeff, I mean, given everything that's happening with the coronavirus and we're seeing so much shut down in the U.S., is there a risk on the supply side for oil? I mean, I know obviously you're seeing the demand pressure, but if this virus does spread further in the Middle East, do you see disruptions on that front? Well, in terms of looking at, there's two, there's economically driven disruptions, and then there's the disruptions that are driven more by physical problems like people not showing up to work and things of that nature. That latter is always a risk, but I think when we look at the economic um, risk, the Middle East are the low-cost players. They're the ones that ramping up. In fact, the rise in production is far above what our expectations were even a week ago. Um, but I think in terms of thinking about the economic disruptions, what is amazing about this and, you know, why we you know, uh, it was a violent and swift rebalancing is that in the U.S., you know, we're only three and a half days into into this. We have seen more than 15 companies announce reductions in their CapEx of greater than 30 percent. That's a mm -hmm. significant impact we've already seen. And so when I think about that, you know, the implications, that disruptions, that's what we're seeing. Their point I want to emphasize is that this price war, whatever you want to call it, I like to view it as a second round effect of the virus. It's not two separate and distinct events. It's just a continuation of the same event. So Jeff, in that scenario, because the rhetoric is, you know, companies are going to slash CapEx, eventually there's going to see a lot of bankruptcies because they can't sustain this. But if we cut fast enough uh, and the prices can recover fast enough, does it actually push off these kind of bankruptcies uh, that we're thinking about and the defaults that we're thinking about? Absolutely not. I mean, the whole point of this is to finally get to the point of restructuring this industry. I like to emphasize back in 2015, our lower for longer thesis was really predicated on the 